He is poor, who has need of another, and has not from himself all things which are useful for life. He is an abscess on the universe, who withdraws and separates himself from the reason of our common nature, through being displeased with the things which happen. For the same nature produces this, and has produced thee too. He is a peace rent asunder from the state, who tears his own soul from that of reasonable animals, which is one. The one is a philosopher without a tunic, and the other without a book. Here is another half naked. Bread I have not, he says, and I abide by reason, and I do not get the means of living out of my learning, and I abide by my reason. Love the art, poor as it may be, which thou hast learned, and be content with it, and pass through the rest of life like one who has entrusted to the gods with his whole soul all that he has, making thyself neither the tyrant nor the slave of any man. Consider, for example, the times of Vespasian. Thou wilt see all these things, people marrying, bringing up children, sick, dying, warring, feasting, trafficking, cultivating the ground, flattering, obstinately arrogant, suspecting, plotting, wishing for someone to die, grumbling about the present, loving, heaping up treasure, desiring consulship, kingly power. Well then, that life of these people no longer exists at all. Again, remove to the times of Trajan. Again, all is the same. Their life too is gone. In like manner, view also the other epochs of time and of whole nations, and see how many after great efforts soon fell and were resolved into the elements. But chiefly, thou shouldest think of those whom thou hast thyself known distracting themselves about idle things, neglecting to do what was in accordance with their proper constitution, and to hold firmly to this and to be content with it. And herein it is necessary to remember that the attention given to everything has its proper value and proportion. For thus thou wilt not be dissatisfied if thou appliest thyself to smaller matters no further than is fit. The words which were formerly familiar are now antiquated. So also the names of those who were famed of old are now in a manner antiquated. Camillus, Seso, Volessus, Leonatus, and a little after also Scipio and Cato, then Augustus, then also Hadrianus and Antoninus. For all things soon pass away and become a mere tale and complete oblivion soon buries them. And I say this of those who have shown in a wondrous way. For the rest, as soon as they have breathed out their breath, they are gone, and no man speaks of them. And to conclude the matter, what is even an eternal remembrance? A mere nothing. What then is that about which we ought to employ our serious pains? This one thing, thoughts just, and acts social, and words which never lie, and a disposition which gladly accepts all that happens as necessary, as usual, as flowing from a principle and source of the same kind. Willingly give thyself up to Clotho, one of the fates, allowing her to spin thy thread into whatever things she pleases. Everything is only for a day, both that which remembers and that which is remembered. Observe constantly that all things take place by change, and accustom thyself to consider that the nature of the universe loves nothing so much as to change the things which are, and to make new things like them. For everything that exists is in a manner the seed of that which will be. But thou art thinking only of seeds which are cast into the earth, or into a womb. But this is a very vulgar notion. Thou wilt soon die, and thou art not yet simple, nor free from perturbations, nor without suspicion of being hurt by external things, nor kindly disposed towards all. Nor dost thou yet place wisdom only in acting justly. Examine men's ruling principles, even those of the wise, what kind of things they avoid, and what kind they pursue. What is evil to thee does not subsist in the ruling principle of another, nor yet in any turning and mutation of thy corporeal covering. Where is it, then? It is in that part of thee in which subsists the power of forming opinions about evils. Let this power then not form such opinions, and all is well. And if that which is nearest to it, the poor body, is cut, burnt, filled with matter and rottenness, nevertheless 
let the part which forms opinions about these things be quiet. That is, let it judge that nothing is either bad or good which can happen equally to the bad man and the good. For that which happens equally to him lives contrary to nature, and to him who lives according to nature is neither according to nature nor contrary to nature. Constantly regard the universe as one living being, having one substance and one soul, and observe how all things have reference to one perception, the perception of this one living being, and how all things act with one movement, and how all things are the cooperating causes of all things which exist. Observe, too, the continuous spinning of the thread and the contexture of the web. Thou art a little soul bearing about a corpse, as Epictetus used to say. It is no evil for things to undergo change, and no good for things to subsist in consequence of change. Time is like a river made up of the events which happen, and a violent stream. For as soon as a thing has been seen, it is carried away, and another comes in its place, and this will be carried away too. Everything which happens is as familiar and well known as the rose in spring and the fruit in summer. For such is disease and death and calumny and treachery and whatever else delights, fools, or vexes them. In the series of things, those which follow are always aptly fitted to those which have gone before, for the series is not like a mere enumeration of disjointed things, which is only a necessary sequence, but it is a rational connection, and as all existing things are arranged together harmoniously, so the things which come into existence exhibit no mere succession, but a certain wonderful relationship. Always remember the saying of Heraclitus, that the death of earth is to become water, and the death of water is to become air, and the death of air is to become fire, and reversely. And think too of him who forgets whither the way leads, and that men quarrel with that with which they are most constantly in communion, the reason which governs the universe. And the things which they daily meet with seem to them strange, and consider that we ought not to act and speak as if we were asleep, for even in sleep we seem to act and speak, and that we ought not, like children who learn from their parents, simply to act and speak as we have been taught. If any god had told thee that thou shalt die tomorrow, or certainly on the day after tomorrow, thou wouldest not care much whether it was on the third day or on the morrow, unless thou wast in the highest degree mean-spirited. For how small is the difference? So think it no great thing to die after as many years as thou canst name rather than tomorrow. Think continually how many physicians are dead after often contracting their eyebrows over the sick, and how many astrologers after predicting with great pretensions the deaths of others, and how many philosophers after endless discourses on death or immortality, how many heroes after killing thousands, and how many tyrants who have used their power over men's lives with terrible insolence as if they were immortal, and how many cities are entirely dead, so to speak, Hellas and Pompeii, and Herculaneum, and others innumerable. Add to the reckoning all whom thou hast known, one after another. One man after burying another has been laid out dead, and another buries him, and all this in a short time. To conclude, always observe how ephemeral and worthless human things are, and what was yesterday a little mucus, tomorrow will be a mummy or ashes. Pass then through this little space of time conformably to nature, and end thy journey in content as an olive falls off when it is ripe, blessing nature who produced it and thanking the tree on which it grew. Be like the promontory against which the waves continually break, but it stands firm and tames the fury of the water around it. Unhappy am I because this has happened to me? Not so. But happy am I, though this has happened to me, because I continue free from pain, neither crushed by the present nor fearing the future. For such a thing as this might have happened to every man, but every man would not have continued free from pain on such an occasion. Why then is that rather a misfortune than this a good fortune? And dost thou in all cases call that a man's misfortune which is not a deviation from man's nature? And does the thing seem to thee to be a deviation from man's nature, when it is not contrary to the will of man's nature? Well, thou knowest the will of nature. Will then this which has happened prevent thee from being just, magnanimous, temperate, prudent, secure against inconsiderate opinions and falsehood, 
will it prevent thee from having modesty, freedom, and everything else, by the presence of which man's nature obtains all that is its own? Remember, too, on every occasion which leads thee to vexation to apply this principle, not that this is a misfortune, but that to bear it nobly is a good fortune. It is a vulgar but still a useful help towards contempt of death to pass in review those who have tenaciously stuck to life. What more, then, have they gained than those who have died early? Certainly they lie in their tombs somewhere at last, Cadicianus, Fabius, Julianus, Lepidus, or anyone else like them, who have carried out many to be buried, and then were carried out themselves. Altogether the interval is small between birth and death, and consider with how much trouble, and in company with what sort of people, and in what a feeble body, this interval is laboriously passed. Do not then consider life a thing of any value. For look to the immensity of time behind thee, and to the time which is before thee, another boundless space. In this infinity, then, what is the difference between him who lives three days and him who lives three generations? Always run to the short way, and the short way is the natural. Accordingly, say and do everything in conformity with the soundest reason. For such a purpose frees a man from trouble and warfare and all artifice and ostentatious display. Book 5 In the morning, when thou risest unwillingly, let this thought be present. I am rising to the work of a human being. Why, then, am I dissatisfied if I am going to do the things for which I exist and for which I was brought into the world? Or have I been made for this, to lie in the bedclothes and keep myself warm? But this is more pleasant. Dost thou exist, then, to take thy pleasure and not at all for action or exertion. Dost thou not see the little plants, the little birds, the ants, the spiders, the bees working together to put in order their several parts of the universe? And art thou unwilling to do the work of a human being, and dost thou not make haste to do that which is according to thy nature? But it is necessary to take rest also. It is necessary. However, nature has fixed bounds to this too, she has fixed bounds to eating and drinking, and yet thou goest beyond these bounds, beyond what is sufficient. Yet in thy acts it is not so, but thou stoppest short of what thou canst do. So thou lovest not thyself, for if thou didst, thou wouldst love thy nature and her will. But those who love their several arts exhaust themselves in working at them, unwashed and without food. But thou valuest thy own nature less than the turner values the turning art or the dancer the dancing art, or the lover of money values his money, or the vainglorious man his little glory. And such men, when they have a violent affection to a thing, choose neither to eat nor to sleep, rather than to perfect the things which they care for. But are the acts which concern society more vile in the eyes and less worthy of thy labor? How easy it is to repel and to wipe away every impression which is troublesome or unsuitable, and immediately to be in all tranquility. Judge every word and deed which are according to nature, to be fit for thee, and be not diverted by the blame which follows from any people, nor by their words. But if a thing is good to be done or said, do not consider it unworthy of thee. For those persons have their peculiar leading principle, and follow their peculiar movement. Which things do not thou regard, but go straight on, following thy own nature, and the common nature, and the way of both is one. I go through the things which happen according to nature until I shall fall and rest, breathing out my breath into that element out of which I daily draw it in, and falling upon that earth out of which my father collected the seed, and my mother the blood, and my nurse the milk, out of which during so many years I have been supplied with food and drink, which bears me when I tread on it and abuse it for so many purposes. Thou sayest, Men cannot admire the sharpness of thy wits. Be it so, but there are many other things of which thou canst not say. I am not formed from them by nature. Show those qualities then which are altogether in thy power, sincerity, gravity, endurance of labor, aversion to pleasure, contentment with thy portion and with few things, benevolence, frankness, no love of superfluity, freedom from trifling, magnanimity, 
Dost thou not see how many qualities thou art immediately able to exhibit, in which there is no excuse of natural incapacity and unfitness, and yet thou still remainest voluntarily below the mark? Or art thou compelled, through being defectively furnished by nature, to murmur, and to be stingy, and to flatter, and to find fault with thy poor body, and to try to please men, and to make great display, and to be so restless in thy mind? No, by the gods, but thou mightest have been delivered from these things long ago. Only if in truth thou canst be charged with being rather slow and dull of comprehension, thou must exert thyself about this also, not neglecting it, nor yet taking pleasure in thy dullness. One man, when he has done a service to another, is ready to set it down to his account as a favor conferred. Another is not ready to do this, but still in his own mind he thinks of the man as his debtor, and he knows what he has done. A third, in a manner, does not even know what he has done, but he is like a vine which has produced grapes, and seeks for nothing more after it has once produced its proper fruit. As a horse when he has a run, a dog when he has tackled the game, a bee when it has made the honey, so a man, when he has done a good act, does not call out for others to come and see, but he goes on to another act, as a vine goes on to produce again the grapes in season. Must a man then be one of these, who in a manner act thus without observing it? Yes, but this very thing is necessary, the observation of what a man is doing, for it may be said, it is characteristic of the social animal to perceive that he is working in a social manner, and indeed to wish that his social partner also should perceive it. It is true that thou sayest, but thou dost not rightly understand what is now said, and for this reason thou wilt become one of those of whom I spoke before, for even they are misled by a certain show of reason. But if thou wilt choose to understand the meaning of what is said, do not fear that for this reason thou wilt omit any social act. A Prayer of the Athenians Rain, rain, O oh dear Zeus, down on the ploughed fields of the Athenians and on the plains. In truth, we ought not to pray at all, or we ought to pray in this simple and noble fashion. Just as we might understand when it is said that Asculapius prescribed to this man horse exercise, or bathing in cold water, or going without shoes, so we must understand it when it is said that the nature of the universe prescribed to this man disease, or mutilation, or loss, or anything else of the kind. For in the first case, prescribed means something like this. He prescribed this for this man as a thing adapted to procure health, and in the second case it means that which happens to, or suits every man, is fixed in a manner for him suitably to his destiny. For this is what we mean when we say that things are suitable to us, as the workmen say of squared stones and walls or the pyramids, that they are suitable when they fit them to one another in some kind of connection, for there is altogether one fitness or harmony. And as the universe is made up of all bodies to be such a body as it is, so out of all existing causes, necessity or destiny is made up to be such a cause as it is. And even those who are completely ignorant understand what I mean, for they say it, necessity and destiny, brought this to such a person. This then was brought, and this was prescribed to him. Let us then receive these things, as well as those which Asculapius prescribes. Many, as a matter of course, even among his prescriptions are disagreeable, but we accept them in the hope of health. Let the perfecting and accomplishment of the things which the common nature judges to be good be judged by thee to be of the same kind as thy health. And so accept everything which happens, even if it seem disagreeable, because it leads to this, to the health of the universe and to the prosperity and felicity of Zeus, or the universe, for he would not have brought on any man what he has brought if it were not useful for the whole. Neither does the nature of anything, whatever it may be, cause anything which is not suitable to that which is directed by it. For two reasons, then, it is right to be content with that which happens to thee. The one, because it was done for thee and prescribed for thee, and in a manner had reference to thee, originally from the most ancient causes spun with thy destiny, and the other, because even that which comes severally to every man is to the power which administers the universe a cause of felicity and perfection, nay, even of its very continuance. 
For the integrity of the whole is mutilated, if thou cuttest off anything, whatever, from the conjunction and the continuity, either of the parts or of the causes, and thou dost cut off as far as it is in thy power, when thou art dissatisfied, and in a manner tries to put anything out of the way. Be not disgusted, nor discouraged, nor dissatisfied, if thou dost not succeed in doing everything according to right principles. But when thou hast failed, return back again, and be content if the greater part of what thou doest is consistent with man's nature, and love this to which thou returnest. And do not return to philosophy as if she were a master, but act like those who have sore eyes and apply a bit of sponge and egg, or as another applies a plaster, or drenching with water. For thus thou wilt not fail to obey reason, and thou wilt repose in it. And remember that philosophy requires only things which thy nature requires, but thou wouldst have something else which is not according to nature. It may be objected. Why, what is more agreeable than this which I am doing? But is not this the very reason why pleasure deceives us? And consider if magnanimity, freedom, simplicity, equanimity, piety are not more agreeable. For what is more agreeable than wisdom itself, when thou thinkest of the security and the happy course of all things which depend on the faculty of understanding and knowledge? Things are in such a kind of envelopment that they have seemed to philosophers, not a few nor those common philosophers, altogether unintelligible. Nay, even to the Stoics themselves they seem difficult to understand. And all our assent is changeable. For where is the man who never changes? Carry thy thoughts, then, to the objects themselves, and consider how short-lived they are, and worthless, and that they may be in the possession of a filthy wretch, or a whore, or a robber. Then turn to the morals of those who live with thee, and it is hardly possible to endure even the most agreeable of them, to say nothing of a man being hardly able to endure himself. In such darkness, then, and dirt, and in so constant a flux of both substance and of time, and of motion, and of things moved, what there is worth being highly prized, or even an object of serious pursuit, I cannot imagine. But on the contrary, it is a man's duty to comfort himself, and to wait for the natural dissolution, and not to be vexed at the delay, but to rest in these principles only. The one, that nothing will happen to me which is not conformable to the nature of the universe, and the other, that it is in my power never to act contrary to my God and Damon, for there is no man who will compel me to this. About what am I now employing my own soul? On every occasion I must ask myself this question, and inquire, what have I now in this part of me which they call the ruling principle? And whose soul have I now, that of a child, or of a young man, or of a feeble woman, or of a tyrant, or of a domestic animal, or of a wild beast? What kind of things those are which appear good to the many, we may learn even from this. For if a man should conceive certain things as being really good, such as prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, he would not have, after having first conceived these, endured to listen to anything which should not be in harmony with what is really good. But if a man has first conceived as good the things which appear to the many to be good, he will listen and readily receive as very applicable that which was said to be the comic writer. Thus even the many perceive the difference. For were it not so, this saying would not offend and would not be rejected in the first case, while we receive it when it is said of wealth, and of the means which further luxury and fame, as said fitly and wittily. Go on then, and ask if we should value and think those things to be good, to which, after their first conception in the mind, the words of the comic writer might be aptly applied, that he who has them, through pure abundance, has not a place to ease himself in. I am composed of the formal and the material, and neither of them will perish into non-existence, as neither of them came into existence out of non-existence. Every part of me, then, will be reduced by change into some part of the universe, and that again will change into another part of the universe, and so on forever. And by consequence of such a change, I too exist, and those who begot me, and so on forever in the other direction. For nothing hinders us from saying so, even if the universe is administered according to the definite periods of revolution. Reason and the reasoning art, or philosophy, are powers which are sufficient for themselves and for their own works. They move then from a first principle, which is their own, 
and they make their way to the end which is proposed to them. And this is the reason why such acts are named catarthosius, or right acts, which word signifies that they proceed by the right road. None of these things ought to be called a man's, which do not belong to a man, as man. They are not required of a man, nor does man's nature promise them, nor are they the means of man's nature attaining its end. Neither, then, does the end of man lie in these things, nor yet that which aids to the accomplishment of this end, and that which aids towards this end is that which is good. Besides, if any of these things did belong to man, it would not be right for a man to despise them and to set himself against them, nor would a man be worthy of praise who showed that he did not want these things, nor would he who stinted himself in any of them be good, if indeed these things were good. But now, the more of these things a man deprives himself of, or of other things like them, or even when he is deprived of any of them, the more patiently he endures the loss, just in the same degree he is a better man. Such as are thy habitual thoughts, such also will be the character of thy mind, for the soul is dyed by the thoughts. Die it then with a continuous series of such thoughts as these. For instance, that where a man can live, there can he also live well. But he must live in a palace. Well then, he can also live well in a palace. And again consider that for whatever purpose each thing has been constituted. For this it has been constituted, and towards this it is carried. And its end is in that towards which it is carried. And where the end is, there also is the advantage and the good of each thing. Now the good for the reasonable animal is society, for that we are made for society has been shown above. Is it not plain that the inferior exists for the sake of the superior? But the things which have life are superior to those which have not life, and of those which have life the superior are those which have reason. To seek what is impossible is madness, and it is impossible that the bad should not do something of this kind. Nothing happens to any man which he is not formed by nature to bear. The same things happen to another, and either because he does not see that they have happened, or because he would show a great spirit, he is firm and remains unharmed. It is a shame, then, that ignorance and conceit should be stronger than wisdom. Things themselves touch not the soul, not in the least degree, nor have they admission to the soul, nor can they turn or move the soul, but the soul turns and moves itself alone, and whatever judgments it may think proper to make, such it makes for itself the things which present themselves to it. In one respect, man is the nearest thing to me, so far as I must do good to men and endure them, but so far as some men make themselves obstacles to my proper acts, man becomes to me one of the things which are indifferent, no less than the sun or wind or a wild beast. Now it is true that these may impede my action, but they are no impediments to my effects and disposition, which have the power of acting conditionally and changing. For the mind converts and changes every hindrance to its activity into an aid, and so that which is a hindrance is made a furtherance to an act, and that which is an obstacle on the road helps us on the road. Reverence that which is best in the universe, and this is that which makes use of all things and directs all things. And in like manner also reverence that which is best in thyself, and this is of the same kind as that. For in thyself also, that which makes use of everything else is this, and thy life is directed by this. That which does no harm to the state, does no harm to the citizen. In the case of every appearance of harm, apply this rule. If the state is not harmed by this, neither am I harmed. But if the state is harmed, thou must not be angry with him who does harm to the state. Show him where his error is. Often think of the rapidity with which things pass by and disappear, both the things which are and the things which are produced. For substance is like a river in a continual flow, and the activities of things are in constant change, and the causes work in infinite varieties, and there is hardly anything which stands still. And consider this which is near to thee, this boundless abyss of the past and of the future in which all things disappear. How then? Is he not a fool who is puffed up with such things or plagued about them and makes himself miserable? For they vex him only for a time and a short time. Think of the universal substance of which thou hast a very small portion, and of universal time of which a short and indivisible interval has been assigned to thee, and of that which is fixed by destiny, and how small a part of it thou art.
does another do me wrong? Let him look to it. He has his own disposition, his own activity. I now have what the universal nature now wills me to have, and I do what my nature now wills me to do. Let the part of thy soul which leads and governs be undisturbed by the movements in the flesh, whether of pleasure or of pain, and let it not unite with them, but let it circumscribe itself and limit those affects to their parts. But when these affects rise up to the mind by virtue of that other sympathy that naturally exists in a body which is all one, then thou must not strive to resist the sensation, for it is natural. But let not the ruling part of itself add to the sensation, the opinion that it is either good or bad. Live with the gods, and he does live with the gods who constantly shows to them that his own soul is satisfied with that which is assigned to him, and that it does all that the daemon wishes, which Zeus hath given to every man for his guardian and guide, a portion of himself. And this is every man's understanding and reason. Art thou angry with him whose armpits stink? Art thou angry 